This talk and the one after mine by Rich Rotuno are focused on the, the maximum intensity of, of hurricanes. So I thought I would spend a slide talking about why we would want to study these most intense storms. And I listed a couple of reasons here. One is there's good observations. We have a very good idea of what the strongest storm intensities are in terms of uh, maximum sustained winds, lowest central pressure. And that's especially true in the Atlantic where there's a routine air plane reconnaissance. There's also theoretical limits on maximum intensity. And this provides a framework for understanding the results and maybe for understanding why some storms, uh, some numerically simulated storms, for example, are not at maximum intensity or, as I'll show you later, why some numerical models produce storms that are stronger than have ever been observed. And in, I like it because it's a simple test of numerical modeling systems uh, without the complications of, of real data cases. You can study this by putting in to your numerical model a, a fixed SST and uh, a specified environment and you can study uh, how intense the storm gets. Uh, and relate it back to these other observational and, and theoretical aspects. And uh, a few slides on these, these three methods. The observational, uh, here's an example of a study which looked at the maximum sustained winds as a function of, of sea surface temperature. And this, in my talk, is going to be the, uh, the benchmark, the truth that I'm going to compare against. Um, and the advantages, of course, of the observational method is it's very accurate. Um, we have root, routine airplane reconnaissance. We, we're pretty confident in these numbers. The disadvantage is uh, observational technique is not useful for some applications, like those of you interested in climate change. If you wanted to know what will happen in a sea surface temperature of 35 Celsius, well, you could extrapolate this curve, but you don't really know if that's what's really going to happen. And I would argue the observational method has uh, some phys limited physical insight. You don't know what are the other uh, components uh, or other processes that might give you uh, weaker or, or, or stronger storms. So method number two, the theoretical, here's a figure from uh, the famous article by Carrie Emanuel. Uh, was plotted only here's the maximum sustained winds in these numbers as a function of the sea surface temperature, uh, but also what he calls the outflow temperature. You can think of this as the temperature in the upper troposphere, or maybe like a, a, a tropopause uh, temperature. And so um, in today's climate, uh, outflow temperature is around minus 60, minus 70 Celsius, and you can see that uh, if you fix that number as a function of sea surface temperature, you see that maximum winds are very close to the observed on the previous slide. The advantages of the theoretical method is that you get great physical insight. You can really put your finger on um, what controls maximum intensity and why. It's also adaptable. You can run it in future climates, other planets, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Uh, the disadvantages, um, Rich is going to talk about this more in his next talk. It requires some approximations. And we know now in some articles that have... Uh, uh, highlighted this in recent years that the theoretical uh, maximum intensity uh, is actually a little bit lower than actual maximum intensity of, of observed storms. And this is where um, my interest comes in in numerical simulations. The advantages of studying maximum intensity by numerical simulations is it's easy. You can just take a code that someone's written already, like the WARF model, um, put in an idealized environment, like a single sounding, a single SST, and just let the model go. Put in a weak vortex. Turns out that the disadvantages to this approach is there's a great sensitivity to uncertain parameters in the modeling system. Now I'm going to talk about this mostly in my talk. And here's a figure from a recent paper of mine which shows the maximum sustained winds um, as a function of one model parameter. Now this is the, the same sea surface temperature, the same sounding, the same everything. All I did was I changed this number and I ran the model again. So each dot is a different model simulation. And you see I can get a storm with maximum winds of 30 meters per second or 120 meters per second if I want to. I'm going to talk about this slide more later, so I'll describe it more later. Ooh, that's a nice symbol. I didn't... Mm. <laughs> I'm going to spend most of my talk studying about this numerical study of maximum hurricane intensity. I used a non-hydrostatic, cloud-resolving research model called CM1. There's uh, details in this monthly weather review article if you're interested. The setup for everything I'm going to show you here um, uses this sounding. We, we actually launched our, our study from uh, that of Rotuno and Emanuel. It was a very influential paper that a number of people have followed up on. Uh, so we also decided that would be a good place to, uh, um, as a benchmark, to run from. First, I'm going to run a bunch of axisymmetric simulations and show you the results. So if you're not familiar with an axisymmetric model, it's two-dimensional. The two dimensions are the radius away from the storm center and the height above ground. And then later, I'll show you what happens when you move to three-dimensional simulations. Uh, the sea surface temperature is constant, um, always. There's no uh, ocean coupling. It's 26.1 Celsius. That's, again, just following from this study here. The horizontal, that's delta, obviously. The delta R is one kilometer. The delta Z is 250 meters, unless I tell you otherwise. The 
ratio of the exchange coefficients for enthalpy and momentum, or the, or the drag, is 1 by default. I'm going to show you what happens later when I change that. And then there's simple microphysics and radiation as uh, following the Rotunu and Manual study. Um, okay, here's what the initial conditions look like. Uh, there's a 1,500 kilometer domain. Uh, in the initial state, we put in this broad, weak vortex. This is azimuthal velocity. So even though it's a 2D model, in axisymmetric models, you get three wind components. You get that. Uh, in the plane of the cross section. And what's more interesting is the azimuthal velocity. So this is the, if you're not familiar, this is the velocity into the, uh, into the, the model plane here. And that's what the theory addresses. And if you run for about 10 days, what happens is you end up with a structure that looks like this. The yellow is cloud and the orange is rain, so you start off subsaturated. And you end up with uh, you know, clouds and, and an eye, eye wall that slopes outward. And um, some Fairly realistic features, you know, there's a, a mostly cloud-free eye. Um, and so there's a, that's the, the kind of setup, and that's what the uh, kind of output looks like from an axisymmetric model. Here's what the time series of maximum azimuthal velocity looks like. This is from any model grid point, and this tends to be about a kilometer above the ground. So this is, this is not surface winds. This is a, a top of the boundary layer winds. Um, you run the model for the first couple of days and not much happens. You get a very weak, uh, slight weakening under the influence of, of surface friction. What's happening in this time period is the model is uh, developing moisture and you're moistening the core. When you moisten over a, a broad enough area, you get this period of rapid intensification. And then in this highly idealized environment, you get uh, a steady uh, azimuthal velocity for a you know, number of days. And this is the, I just average over 8 to 12 days. And this is the number I'm interested in. This, uh, in this case, it's 98 meters per second is the sustained maximum intensity from, from this numerical model. I'd like to point out, um, this is one of the reasons I'm so interested in this topic. The maximum observed intensity for this environment, meaning about 26 degrees uh, SST, is about 65 meters per second. That's adjusted to be uh, at the top of the boundary layer. Um, you can argue about this number a little bit, maybe as low as 60, maybe as high as 70. But nevertheless, it's in. Uh, this neighborhood, and it's definitely not 100 meters per second. Okay, so why is, I'm not the first person to show this. Uh, numerical models can produce intensities that have never been observed. And so, the point of this study by uh, Brian and Rotuno uh, was to turn the knobs in the model and see, well, what aspect of the model is responsible for this? Or, or what do I have to do to the numerical model to make it go away, and is that consistent with observations? And I'm not going to go through all these things we studied, but in order from least important to most important for affecting that number, that Vmax, um, I'll let you read through the list here. I would say resolution um, as, is not important as long as you have some critical resolution. We found that it was a delta uh, R less than 8 kilometers. So horizontal grid spacing less than 8 kilometers and vertical grid spacing less than 500. These numbers will not hold up in a three-dimensional model, so be, be careful about translating this to other modeling systems. Uh, of more importance um, are these last three, the fall velocity of condensate, surface exchange coefficients, and turbulence. And I'm going to talk about the uh, turbulence here for the rest of my talk. Boy, that symbol just likes to come back, doesn't it? Um, two notes on turbulence as an axisymmetric model before I start to show you some more results. The first thing you need to know is that uh, turbulence in an axisymmetric model must account for not only the turbulence we traditionally think of, which is, you know, you're on an airplane and it's bumpy, that's turbulence, or you're standing outside on a sunny day and you feel a gust of warm wind, that's turbulence. So it does account for that, the boundary layer turbulence, but also anything else that's not represented on the axisymmetric, the constraints of this two-dimensional grid. So it must also account for roll vortices, eye wall mesovortices, vortices, Rossby, vortex Rossby waves, you know, whatever else is uh, really happening in, in fully complex three-dimensional simulations. And the second thing I want to point out is how the turbulence is handled in, in this axisymmetric model, which is just following up on some what, what others have done, uh, we use an eddy viscosity, which is this new sub H. And the eddy viscosity in the horizontal direction ends up being the most important parameter. Not, not the vertical mixing, but the horizontal. Uh, it's, in this model, it's proportional to L squared, which is a, a length scale, which is unknown. You have to set it in your model. And the deformation, uh, uh, the horizontal deformation. So that's like the uh, horizontal shear of the uh, radial velocity or the horizontal shear of the tangential velocity, for example. You know this, uh, but in order to get the viscosities, um, you need to specify this L sub H. So one of the things we did in our studies, we just, we just changed the value for L sub H, ran a new simulation, compared it to other ones. And, and that was this figure that I showed you earlier. 
This is what happens when you vary L sub H from um, values that have been used in the published literature before. Right? So anywhere from 30 meters per second to 100 meters per, se per second. Um, for those of you that like uh, minimum central pressure, the uh, p-min from this simulation is 979. Uh, the, the minimum pressure for this simulation was 865. That's, that's lower than has ever been observed in any hurricane ever, and let alone for a 26 degree SST. So these are clearly uh, unphysical results here. One thing I would like to point out is we think this explains a lot of previous studies. This Rotuno and Emanuel 1987 article, they used L sub H of 3,000, and they compared to observations and theory, and they found you know, great correspondence. But uh, Persing and Montgomery, in a more recent study, uh, used the same axisymmetric model, um, but they changed L sub H, and they found um, these uh, unnaturally large uh, azimuthal velocities, although we think it, um, how to explain those results has everything to do with this horizontal uh, diffusion rather than the mechanisms they discussed in their article. And even more recently, Hausman et al. had no turbulence model in the radial direction in their model, so they essentially had an L sub H of zero, and they, like us, see uh, tangential velocity well in excess of 100 meters per second. And um, so that's why th this, this topic is not just uh, um, you know, focused on this particular model. It's in other numerical models. It's in other published studies in, in recent years. So what's going on? Oh, man, this is horrible. Um, this is a plot of theta e as a function of radius at the one kilometer above ground for three different simulations that use three different values for L sub h. Uh, so what happens is as you go to larger L sub h, this leads to larger eddy viscosities, which leads to weaker radial gradients. OK, so you can see here this, this low L sub h run has a very large uh, gradient in theta e. And then as you increase L sub h, you have weaker gradients in, in theta e. And that, it, it's just intuitive. You increase uh, diffusion, it just smooths everything out. And weaker radial gradients are consistent with a weaker cyclone by uh, thermal wind arguments, just basic uh, hydrostatic and uh, gradient wind balance. If you want the cyclone to spin faster, you have to have a warmer core. To have a warmer core for the same environment, you have to ramp up faster. Um, yes. OK. OK, so the question people ask me is, what happens in three-dimensional simulations? And the nice thing about this model, uh, CM1, is you can uh, switch from an axisymmetric to a 3D model fairly easily. This is surface reflectivity in a three-dimensional version of the model for the same setup, same physics, same numerics. Um, and you can see um, I'm comparing the actual azimuthally average. So you take your three-dimensional simulation, you average around these uh, circles to compare to the axisymmetric model. And we find slightly weaker, although comparable, uh, intensities. Uh, here's what the vertical velocity looks like from that simulation with one kilometer grid spacing. The reds are up, so notice you have um, up everywhere. It's a very smooth eye wall, and so the, the eye wall is not turbulent. This is even with one kilometer horizontal grid spacing. And um, so this tells you that you even have to parameterize turbulence in a three-dimensional model. And this is some more recent results I have. I only got three dots on this chart right now from the three-dimensional model, but we're going to fill this out later. And so the message here is if you have the same kind of um, turbulence model in a three-dimensional model, it's still sensitive to that L sub H. And it's still sensitive in the same way, although there's that slight offset. Um, but there's this very steep uh, gradient in the results if you change L sub H. And um, darn. <laughs> I, I went and looked up what was in the ARW model. And it's L sub H. This ARW model uses the same type of parameterization that I have in CM1. Uh, it's called the 2D Smagorinsky scheme or something like that. L sub H is 0.25 times the horizontal grid spacing. And so if you're using 4 kilometer horizontal grid spacing, you have a 1 kilometer value of L sub H, and you're in this part of the parameter space where your, uh, your cyclone it, it can be affected very strongly by uh, this dif diffusion, this uh, turbulence parameterization. If you're using 1 kilometer horizontal grid spacing, the one in the ARW, your L sub H is 250, and you might as well not even have a, a horizontal diffusion, uh, horizontal deformation-based turbulence scheme. It's, it's so weak. So again, this, this issue is not just relevant to axisymmetric models or idealized models. This, if you're running ARW and doing real-time simulations, uh, I've been telling people for a while now that I think one kilometer runs with ARW are, are going to be systematically too intense. And I think that's actually starting to come out in some studies I've seen that, that show a positive bias in the ARW for, for very small grid spacing. OK, this is going to take uh, just a couple minutes. We've been running 
some large eddy simulations which don't require uh, a subject turbulence parameterization. If you actually resolve the turbulent eddies, uh, you don't have to have a turbulence parameterization. So following a recent study by Rotuno et al., you may have seen published recently in BAMS, uh, this is how you do uh, high resolution in CM1. It doesn't have nesting. It just has this horizontal grid stretching. And so I have, you can have this fine mesh domain in a 3D run. And so this is simulations with 62.5 meter grid spacing. Uh, in here, some awkward rectangles outside, but we're mainly interested in the eye wall. And this takes so long to run, we just take the one kilometer model run and uh, run, put it on this grid and run it forward. So here's what the results look like with a one kilometer grid spacing, very smooth. Uh, when you run with 62 meter grid spacing, not surprisingly, you get more detail. You get a lot of turbulence. Uh, the maximum azimuth velocity came down about uh, 10%. Uh, this is work in progress. Uh, to understand this result, I'm actually going to skip these slides here. This is in um, a journal, uh, a conference paper I published. On the top here is the azimuthally averaged moist entropy. And I said gradients are important. Look what happens when you use one kilometer horizontal grid spacing. Everything collapses down to a, a very small scale. And when you use a higher grid spacing, you resolve turbulence. What this turbulence is doing is it's just wildly mixing this eye wall air, and it's spreading out your entropy gradients. Uh, this is the azimuthal, yeah, this is the radial gradient in azimuthally average S. It's just a, a, a quantification of that. And you can see the uh, average, or the gradient came down by a factor of two. And this tells you that, uh, you know, these very high resolution models with very weak turbulence are producing uh, unrealistic rated gradients. This is closer to observations, actually. You can diagnose L sub H um, from these simulations. Uh, there's a conference paper you can get on my uh, web page. Um, we diagnosed L sub H rather than predicting it. It turns out to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 to 1,500. Um, and that's, um, this is the axisymmetric model results. We said if you want an observed maximum that matches reality, you probably need an L sub H of around 1,500. And that's coming out uh, very consistently in these, these large eddy simulations of, uh, you know, there it is, L sub H, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 in the eye wall. I uh, don't have time for that slide. The summary I'll leave up here for you to read if you can, you know, translate this uh, alien script into English. So thanks for having me. Thanks very much.